An incredibly helpful resource is Unreal Slackers, a Discord community for Unreal Engine users. You can get to it by going to unrealslackers.org. This will give you access to the server. Unreal Slackers is frequented by many of the top community members in the Unreal Engine community, as well as programmers, artists, and designers from Epic Games itself. Once you get onto the Unreal Slackers server, you will find that it is a thriving community of Unreal Engine users from all over the world. I strongly encourage you to check out the guide. Here you will find direct access to all the different channels and boards. Here you will find a general section which gives you access to career chats, industry chats, design chats, events, marketplace, source control, packaging, streaming, and so forth. You can also have areas to share your work, works in progress, release, talk content creation for graphics, animation, audio, architectural visualization, cinematics, level design, paper 2D, visualization and effects, as well as programming sections for blueprints, C++, multiplayer, physics, AI, engine source, editor scripting, plugins, game playabilities and plugins, as well as UI, UMG Slate, platforms including Linux, mobile, web, AR and VR, as well as job boards, those people looking for talent and those people looking for work. I also encourage you to take a look at the news section. Here you'll find links to our release notes, community links, as well as information from our marketplace and various pieces of information that could be helpful on a day-to-day -day basis. Make sure you take full advantage of Unreal Slackers. This is a great place to come and join the community and make sure you participate, share, learn, and take full advantage of this great community. Hello everyone and welcome to another stream, Educator Live Stream. And today we have a very exciting stream called Becoming a AAA Technical Artist. And we've got some very special guests today, including Ryan Brooks, Principal Technical Artist, and Bill Cladis, Senior Technical Artist, and Simon Lombardo, another Senior Technical Artist. And as usual, we have Tom Shannon joining the stream. And we have Mark Flanagan, who's also on the stream in the chat today. And uh, this is going to be really an awesome stream. We've got, as you can see, some of, uh, you know, our excellent technical artists here. And we're going to spend the, the chat today and the, and the stream talking about what it means to be a technical artist, which I think is a, a great topic, uh, what it means to become a technical artist, uh, you know, what a technical artist is. For those of you who are not familiar with it, uh, you know, things that uh, you might want to study if you're in school. Um, Maybe you're a technical artist and you're not even sure that you are a technical artist. Um, and then we're going to turn it over to these guys to talk about, you know, um, how they became technical artists, kind of the work that they do at Epic, uh, you know, maybe even their trajectory of uh, how it started. Because, you know, having talked to them during the week, um, you know, Ryan's been at Epic for a long time. And back when he started at Epic, I don't even think that uh, that was an official title. Um, so it's been a... A really interesting journey and uh, and Simon has come from education so uh you know back when you know you were teaching I don't even think that uh, you were in that trajectory at that time and and Tom is a technical artist here in the education team so uh, I think this is going to be a really great stream we hope that you guys have a lot of questions uh, to ask these guys because this is a really great opportunity to talk to some of uh, epic's very senior technical artists and you know and to really discuss that marriage of art and tech and uh, and to really get to know a lot of these guys. So, you know, you guys know Tom. He's been on the stream uh, for a long time now. Uh, but, you know, let's take just at the very beginning before we actually hand the stream over to these guys, just a minute to let them introduce themselves, uh, just in case you don't know them very well. Uh, let's start with Ryan. Just, you know, tell us a, for a few minutes about yourself and uh, before we hand it over to you and um, uh, so that people get to know you a little bit. Everyone, good to be here again. Yeah, my name is Ryan Brooks and I'm a principal tech artist at Epic. I've been here for about 17 years now. So I started in 2003 actually as an intern for level design. So I kind of did a uh, transition over the first few years of my career here. Uh, first working on level design for Unreal Championship 2 and Unreal Tournament 2004. And slowly transitioning to environment art and then technical art, uh, where, where I still work uh, now. Good for me. 
Fantastic. How about you, Bill? Hey, everybody. I'm Bill Cladis. I've worked in this industry now for I don't know, close to 15 years, and my time at Epic has been about five or six years now. Uh, I've been all over the place, but my game development career path started actually, they were not as a UI artist, uh, <laughs> which seems kind of uh, bizarre, but it, there was a good start because I used to work in graphic design before this. Um, and then I actually transitioned into, into visual effects. I used to do actually a lot of tutorials. So if my voice sounds familiar, a lot of my, my old UE3 Cascade tutorials are still around on the web somewhere. Um, and in the past few years, I've transitioned into um, a lot more of the technical side thing uh, side of things. That's something that I've really wanted to explore and grow. So did a official title transition into technical artist this year. Um, so kind of new in that sense, but still feels familiar. So great. <laughs> now that must be interesting to to have, you know transitioned into something like technical artist and and been like well I'm not really sure what I'm getting into even though I'm sure you did but uh, you know like it's kind of like uh, opening a door that uh, was another door that was pretty open too huh I want to say to be truthful I feel like I've been doing the technical art stuff already for years yeah and I just never formalized it you know so this was just more of like a, hey I keep pushing this direction. Let's just make it official so I can be on the team and doing more of the technical side of things. I'm really enjoying uh, learning and growing on the math side, uh, scripting and a little bit of programming here and there. So, Great, great. And and Simon Lombardi, you're one of the newest guys on the team, actually, and yeah. probably one of the newest guys with the technical artist title. Uh, that you've been doing some killer, killer stuff at Epic. Tell us a little bit Thank about the, and the, and the folks on the stream. About uh, so hi, everybody. My name is Simon Lombardo. Um, I'm a senior tech artist in the advanced project team. So we do like a, a bit of different projects that are not game related. Um, before that, I was a VFX supervisor and then I did some workshop to teach. So I come more from a film background and then slowly transition in games and uh, interaction. So yeah, so I'm guessing what I'm doing is tech art, but I'm like, I'm still also, you know, like artists, we touch a bit on everything. I'm mainly doing stuff with blueprint and behavior trees and material and this epic. So I've been here for three years. Yeah, three years. And so I remember when you first came in, um, and you know, we we talked back then, and and you really weren't hundred percent sure what exactly you were going to end up doing, but you instantly got thrown into <laughs> some really cool projects, and you were like, "Well, I'm going to try to do a little of this, a little of that," and and. Uh, before you know it, you were doing some really amazing stuff. You worked on Thank Speed you. of Light, and you worked on the Apollo uh, 11 the project and the HoloLens project, and and you were <laughs> they threw you into a room with no windows, and, and you never yeah. came out, right? So, yeah, at, at the beginning when I arrived, it was not really sure where I was fitting, and I kind of touched a little bit of everything. So I was doing some material stuff, some animation stuff, some motion capture stuff, and... And then slowly, slowly find my place into the tech art, um, which which touch all of this. So I think that's an interesting segue uh, into what tech artists do. Um, you know, and and I think this kind of goes back to what you were saying, Ryan. That uh, um, back when you started, you were doing uh, environment art, you were doing level design, and um, that kind of trajectory, I mean, back in 2003 and when you were first doing um, the work that you were doing, there were problems, right? And there were problems that needed to be solved. And uh, I think we were talking earlier in the week, um, tech art evolved because there was a marriage of things that needed to occur and, and somebody needed to solve these problems. Uh, you know, can you talk a little bit about, you know, sort of what the trajectory to tech art was maybe in the earlier days um, when sort of the role was defined a little bit more clearly at Epic? Yeah, sure. So uh, this is actually going back a little further now to, I guess it would be uh, Unreal Engine uh, 2 because we started uh, doing a lot of that stuff with Unreal, with the uh, materials and shipping Unreal Tournament and Unreal the different games there uh, in Unreal Engine 2 before we even had uh, Unreal Engine 3 yet. And so there really wasn't as much of a, of a spotlight on the technical aspect of how you would integrate your materials and things like that. In fact, there really wasn't materials. There was just hook up a texture. Uh, so back then when I started, level designers really were 
uh, for the most part, also the environment artist. Be, um, you know, you really didn't even have, you know, the whole PBR concept didn't exist yet outside of film. Right. So what you really had was a uh, environment artist was kind of a texture artist or a modeler, and they would make some assets and level designers would, you know, basically do the level art with these textures and placing these models, but you're doing the lighting, everything. Uh, and in the beginning in Unreal Engine 2, that was fine because the complexity was a lot lower. So you could have a case where, you know, a team of two or three guys could hit a, a big level and make it look decent. Um, and, you know, at that time, we also already had people specializing a little bit where, you know, this guy would be really good at lighting. So he would, he would be asked to do lighting on all the maps, but for the most part, people would do everything. Um, but as we started transitioning into Unreal Engine 3 and having, you know, more materials and more choices uh, and having more technical capability within the engine, it became clear that uh, that whole system of having one or two people work on a level just did not scale up to the type of quality that, that Epic was really shooting for with Gears of War. Mm. Uh, and they were finding, you know, they could have a couple environment artists, or sorry, a couple artists focus on a character uh, and really, you know, it would take a couple of months, but that effort really scaled up with environments. Um, so, you, mm. you know, you couldn't just have one guy just placing all these things and lighting it and doing the materials. It really got broken into a lot more areas. Um, so I kind of transitioned more towards uh, working with the rendering team, you know, as they were adding new features to the engine. You know, they, they need someone who's looking at those features and, and messing with them and providing them feedback on how is it working. Um, as well as, you know, in those early days when we suddenly had these materials we could define, it was a little bit daunting to environment artists who had to start hooking those up. Uh, so what we did was we created a system of master materials, uh, which were just basically materials where you go in and define some basic behavior, uh, like, oh, this is just a standard wall. It has a detail normal. So you check the detail normal box, and now you have a detail normal. Um, or you, you needed some Fresnel for a metal. So you'd have all these check boxes to enable these features. Uh, so it really started out for me as being the guy who helped make these master materials uh, that then would be used in different parts of, of the engine. Um, and then, you know, a, as the engine got different capabilities like Kismet, which later became Blueprints, uh, and then later more scriptable rendering, it kind of just unlocked more what you can do in, in, inside of technical art um, to now where you can pretty much do almost anything in the engine uh, when it comes to render targets or Blueprints or Houdini or whatnot. Um, and, you know, now continuing that analogy from before where we used to have one or two people hand making things for levels and placing things by hand, now we have you know, procedural capabilities as a possibility. Um, so there's even more things for technical artists to do. It's, you know, anywhere where there's a need to create something where there's not a clearly defined role already, I feel like technical art has kind of stepped in and filled the gap. Mm. Um, you know, as we have more mm -hmm. need for high quality filmic effects in games, you know, more people with uh, Houdini knowledge and good knowledge of pipeline, importing and exporting data, visualizing data, all those skills become more valuable. But for me, it was kind of natural that, as with the engine got more technical, we needed someone to kind of be that intermediary, even just of communication. Um, so in some cases, it's you you doing less of the nitty gritty stuff and helping other people do it, uh, and also just being a resource for other people on the team. Environment artists all the time are want to do some some thing. They say, "Hey, how do I do this? I forgot what feature it is because we have so many features, and you just they need someone to be the resource to help." So yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, so uh, you you touch on something that I want to sort of bring up, you know, really to all of you is which is a, uh, you know, back then when you were doing that, you you were pretty young. I mean, you're you're still relatively young. Uh, so, uh, you know, the the skills required in many ways, you know, math skills, um, you know, art skills, science skills, you know, the variety of different skills throughout the whole trajectory. I mean, going into Gears Three when normal maps and you know, all the different technologies were emerging. Um, it's not like, uh, you know, you were here in North Carolina, you know, it's not like you're in the mecca of, of you know, technology, even though North Carolina is a very progressive place, you know, and there's a lot of technology here, you know, as a young person, how do you go out and seek out all the, you know, the math skills? How do you go out and seek out all the technology information that you need and still, you know, be relatively young? You know, it's not like you're going to school at the same time and, and uh, you know, have access. Even back then, the internet was still fairly new in many ways. You know, how do you feed the need to learn what you need to know, uh, still being a relatively young person to 
kind of carve the skill set uh, to, to become a technical artist and help define, you know, technical art here at Epic. You know, that, that me, question is for of, all of you guys. Yeah. For me, it boils down to, and obviously tech art has expanded into tons of subfields and not everyone needs to know the same thing. But what comes up over and over again is, is things like vector math. Uh, and I say fairly basic vector math that most people probably already were exposed to in middle school or even grade school, depending on what country. Um, but a lot of times there's a disconnect when it comes to applying that vector math once you get inside of a game engine or inside of a material. And suddenly, you know, you look at a blank material and your mind goes blank and it becomes a lot more difficult to apply those concepts. But basically just challenging yourself to understand some of those basic vector math concepts can be useful time and time again. Uh, and in fact, one of the very first things that I did that was more technical artisty besides just making master shaders was making some default uh, fake volumetric types like fake light cones and fog sheets, as we called them. Um, we use those, you know, before we had real volumetrics, we would just place these kind of cards in the scene. And, you know, that's all just very simple. Like, what is a dot product? That's basically, you know, kind mm. of your bread and butter as a tech artist, which is, you know, the, the technical definition is it returns the cosine of the angle between two vectors. Mm -hmm. But really, it's, you know, if you have two things, it's how, how close are they pointing together? You know, are right. they... Are they planar? Are they perpendicular? Or are they opposite? And that'll right. be anywhere from negative one to zero to one. So once you learn to apply that, that's you know your Fresnels. That's a lot of plane rendering and other things. And it just comes up time and time again. Um, so for me, that's my biggest one. And my second biggest one would be comfortable looking at data, you know, optimization, data management, you know, organization. All those things sound boring, but they're totally valid and really really useful for tech artists to. Be. With the team. Yeah, I'm gonna plus one that to um, vector math, like Ryan's saying. I think that's been a big missing component for me, personally and professionally. Um, I'm kind of learning it later in the game. Um, like our titles imply, not to sound cliche, we you know we have to be both technical people and artistic people. Um, so this might not be as useful to students, but for me personally, like a lot of this stuff, like Ryan's talking about, is universal. Meaning, even though programmers typically aren't working with art itself, they're using all this stuff. Like Ryan's using dot product as an example, right? Like exactly how we tell if two characters are looking close enough to each other, you know, or in the same angle, things like that. So this stuff is universal. So for me, speaking to a lot of programmers when I get stuck, you know, they're good resources to just say, hey, you know, I have this problem, um, so you can learn from that. And I think that's really important. All of these same resources, the way that people are trying to learn to become programmers online, well, like Khan Academy, for example, is free, use those. Like they're free, they are mm -hmm. completely relevant to game development and, and technical art and especially material stuff, blueprint stuff. That's a great place for um, younger people who are trying to break in or, or students who are trying to get in the industry. Um, what else did I wanna say? Don't underestimate the power of uh, the art side. That wasn't a Star Wars joke intentionally, but <laughs> you really do need to have uh, a really good, uh, understanding of aesthetics too. Um, with all, all this great technical knowledge, if you're, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've seen people who are like, I want to make something red and they just plug in a value of one zero zero, you know, and it's like, cool, I'm done. And <laughs> straight into emissive, like have some basic level of, of, you know, color harmonies, things like that, you know, um, that, that, that's really important. So. I think Matt also is, uh, when I joined Epic, Matt was my nemesis, and Bill helped me a lot at the <laughs> beginning. And he helped me demystify the whole thing. It's like like uh, what Ryan was saying is that, yeah, it's the cosine. But actually, it just does that. It's just understanding that it's, it's, it might sound extremely complex, but when you use it actually in a project and you use it in the, in the way it's supposed to be used, then suddenly kind of something click at one point when you use it over and then it you start understanding what it actually does and how you can use it and maybe in a way it was not supposed to be used and i think also a thing with tech art is that at least for me it's it's nice to see okay the the, the instance material can do all of that and that and that and that but the tech artists kind of want to know more the process of how it arrived to that, how things actually work to arrive to that point, mm -hmm. not just mm -hmm. the final product. But okay, I, I love taking apart a lot of things. I, uh, I look through the 
I think Paragon were also the asset from Paragon were a really good example with a lot of this kind of thing. Or when Ryan does something, and I, I look see what was done inside the material function. And a lot of the material function in UE4, you can double click them and open and see actually what they're doing. And that's a really good way to learn a lot of tricks. That, that's something I think like tech art in general, tech artists in general likes to understand the process, not just where to click the button, but actually what it does when you do that. Um, yeah, you bring up a really good point. No, go ahead, Tom. Um, you know, all three of you mentioned and and Ryan, you didn't say mission talent by me. That was a while. But I know for me moving, I came from an art all of us came from art background. Um and we moved into this market. So I was in high school and middle school, I was taking art classes and kind of making it through math classes. That was good enough. It, I wasn't like holding into that and it wasn't applying it or in any way. And so when it came and, and then even when I was doing, I was, I was using, you know, fader nodes and whatever. Maya, and they did it for, I used a Fresnel and it did that math stuff for me. So I didn't really have to tackle it. And when I started learning SO, actually do the math, it, it was ch really challenging. Every day I was like, mm, I remember this from high school, but I really wish I had applied it better then because <laughs> it feels like a, a much harder challenge as an adult learn the learn these kind of basic things and, and get that instinct like you're talking about. Like to be able to like go, Oh, this is facing against the point you said dot. Like it's it's been a kind of a whole struggle to learn all that and I like if if you learn that early as part of your process, becoming a tech. Yeah, there's another good tutorial site. Um, since Bill mentioned Khan Academy, um, there's one called scratch-a-pixel.com. In fact, uh, let me just double check that I'm typing there. Uh, okay. It's called no, no dash. It's just called scratchapixel.com. Um, they have a whole bunch of really good tutorials on um, ray plane intersection, ray sphere intersection, um, you know, cube intersection, all, all these different, you know, very basic operations for rendering and general technical math. Um, and, and if that's the type of thing you're wanting to learn. I also added into the content examples project uh, mm -hmm. in UE4. This is pretty old, but it's a, uh, a map included with content examples called Math Hall. Um, oh, yeah. And I have that loaded up here if we want to, at some point where we're going to go look at stuff. I don't know if that's time yet, but uh, basically it's a couple slides that show in kind of graph form what the output of some of the more commonly used serial nodes in UE4 are. Uh, and it was just to kind of help give an example of what are these different operations? What do they chart like on a graph for one? And then what's an example of something you might do with it? Because sometimes it can be hard to make that that uh, leap from, you know, just a uh, concept to a practical application, unless you see some example on Netflix, and then suddenly you think of five new things. Yeah, why don't you show that Whenever. real quick? Because I think that's a, a great example while we're on the topic. Uh, let me editor work. We talk about it all the time. The math hallway is a, is a great sample. Yeah. I, I, while Ryan's loading that, I can I can kind of add my two cents. Like, I, I feel like most technical artists, if not all of us, tend to be very um, visual thinkers and constructors. And to what Simon was saying about like looking at like mathematical equations and like all the functions and and scripts and stuff, you're like, what the hell am I looking at? What does this mean? You know? <laughs> but then like when you when you actually start like when I show my example later, like when you start like visualizing vectors and things like that is just arrows and directions. It's like, that's how you dem demystify. That's how tech artists like get over that hump. They're like, oh, it's just doing that. The caveat, and I'm gonna throw this in there for those of you who are trying to reverse engineer, is like, I used to do this 10 plus years ago where I would open a material. I'm like, how do they do that? You know, And then I would just see like a, a vector three, maybe like zero, zero, one transformed 
from one coordinate system to the other. And I try to preview that. I'm like, what the hell am I looking at, right? So in, like in those instances, it's actually really difficult and it can actually throw you backwards mm. if you're trying to preview it. Because like artists tend to be like, in the material, this is my texture, right? And I multiplied it by this or did this. And now you preview it, you have a visual like, this is the result. When you're trying to visualize vectors, right? Or, or things like that, or, or vector operations, it gets a little tricky. So just be aware of that. Don't let it, don't let it hold you back too much or discourage you. Yeah, I was going to ask about that because, um, you know, you talked about iteration uh, and dissecting content and iterating through that dissection of content to visualize, you know, math to art. And uh, you just brought it up, you know, on your own. And I think that that's a, that's an important connection that a, helps you to understand that maybe you are a technical artist, right? Or maybe, maybe you get it and maybe you should gravitate toward technical art, you know? Uh, is that a, a point at which you guys were just sort of like, oh, this is something that works for me, works for my brain? Or is it something that you had to continue to iterate through until it just worked, you know? Um, you know, so for those people on the stream that, you know, or maybe if you're an instructor on the stream and you're like, I'm, I need to train technical artists, or I want to train technical artists, is that something that you want to... Uh, practice your students through this exercise of having them iterate through, you know, going from art to tech, tech to art, so that they can develop that, uh, you know, connection, that synergy. Oh, I done found it. So, <laughs> so yeah, there, there is a lot in there, but uh, the thing that I kind of gravitated to is, uh, so when I'm solving a lot of this stuff, you know, I think like most people, because we're technical artists tend to be visual learners, Mm -hmm. uh, I, I tend to think of things a lot more in the intuitive sense, more than the analytical sense at first. Um, in, in how that translates into a material is usually, you know, you, you might not be going into a material thinking exactly, oh, I am like the f of x or some, you know, mathematical term. I'm more thinking, what value can I get here to start controlling this equation? You know, anything mm -hmm. like, is it the texture coordinate? And then I'll just grab a texture coordinate and multiply it and then see what that looks like. Uh, and then plug in my second modification and be like, okay, am I getting somewhere? Uh, and, and, you know, you can kind of follow those breadcrumbs because sometimes it's not entirely clear what you should be solving. You might have some sort of equation in your head. Uh, but like I said before, there's sometimes this thing that happens when you open up a material or, you know, a new shader code file where your mind just goes blank and you've lost any, you know, it's like a brain fart. You don't know what to connect. Uh, right. and when that happens, I... I always revert down to the uh, napkin math. I, I start drawing my little triangles because you know half the time, whatever problem I'm solving, it always reverts down to some sort of triangle or some sort of little, <laughs> you know, a pixel neighborhood or something. So you just draw out your little neighborhood, and then you start figuring out, okay, what's one thing on here that I know I need to connect to one thing mm. in my material or yeah. one thing in my scene, and then you go from there. Because and if it's almost like writer's block, you know, if you sit there and you think, oh, I don't have all the pieces in my head, I'm, I can't fit it together. You know, you have to just start writing something. Uh, so start with what are the knowns, uh, plug in some knowns, and then start to eliminate your unknown. That's great. Uh, and, some, and, and sometimes for certain things, you know, I'll, I'll do something, you know, kind of making it up as I go along for years, and then someone else comes along and makes something formalized and a lot more robust, and then I do it that way from now on. You know, one example for that is uh, there's this function in the engine called HeightLerp. Uh, which is something where you, you blend two textures and you use the height map to kind of give it more interesting detail. Um, in fact, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, I have this loaded up here now, so I'm going to go ahead and do a screen share. If that's Please, all right. yeah. And so um, this is the math hall that I was talking about. It's basically this map you can jump into in content examples and you play around and look at these little functions with graphs. Uh, and it's basically mapping out the result of a formula. And this one is height lerp. Um, and on the, the opposite side, you get an example of what does it do? Um, and it's basically you're varying, you're blending between two things, but using another signal to make it more interesting. So in this case, the height of the tiles, uh, and this is something that I would do, you know, on materials manually by kind of multiplying the alpha by the height map and then adding the height map times the alpha. Uh, but I always, it was always a little bit messy. Uh, so one of the other tech artists at Epic, uh, John Linquist, he actually added the height lerp and it was just kind of packaged up in a little bit more controllable way so that you just add that between two signals and you just get a nice result and you don't have to worry about it going over or under. Um, so that's an example where, you know, I was doing something my own way for a while and then someone defined it in a little bit more intuitive 
a more clear way. And then I just switched to doing it from then on. Uh, and it doesn't really matter who, who did it. Um, but, you know, just very different examples here showing clamping, you know, what, what does clamping do to a texture? You know, you can see, you can clamp the, the max to flatten it. Um, you know, sine is basically like a siren, you know, just showing you, okay, a sine wave, right? Everyone knows what a sine wave looks like, but it graphs it along the material. Um, and you can see, oh, here's a sine wave or, you know, cosine, same as sine wave, but it's offset, using it to do a fluid wave, right? Um, so most of these are pretty basic, just you know, simple one minus or, or density. Uh, and each one will have a, a simple little thing. So this is sphere mask, which is basically a blend without high lerp. But you, know, you might want to control the sharpness of your sphere mask. So this is showing you that. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of these, but this gets into kind of a basic introduction to vector math. Uh, you know, basically the idea that you can even have a one-dimensional one vector, which you think of it like numbers on a line. Um, you know, you could have like the number four is point A, or the number uh, uh, negative one is point B. So if you think about a vector, it really just points between two points. So if, for example, in that case, if you take um, E minus A, it points to A, which in this case, that would be five. So it's telling you, hey, if you move from B five in, in the uh, positive direction, you're going to end up at the other point, right? So, you know, basically just showing that here, you know, a one dimensional vector is really just the difference between them, which shows you where you need to go. Uh, and in, th in two dimensions, it's the same thing. You just have two differences. Um, you know, three dimensions, it, it's the uh, distance formula, which you don't really ever have to use. That's just shown there for convenience mm. sake that this is how it, it ends up working. Uh, showing some examples of how do you compute distance in a shader um, or in a blueprint. And you, showing the result there. Um, so yeah, here, here's an example of a vector in 3D space where you have two points and the vector is basically the line between them. Uh, and then it, it goes further down the chain to get into dot products and other things. But um, you know, I, rather than go through all of it, um, we actually did a stream on that math hall. I want to say, man, must have been six or seven years ago. Hmm. Um, so, so feel free to, to encourage you to watch that and crack open the examples. But yeah, it, it can definitely help to start playing with things in a more isolated fashion like that to help get an understanding of how they work. I yeah, love that's... showing that map to educators yeah. um, because it it does it breaks down that that barrier between game engine and just straight up like what am I teaching my students? I'm teaching them math, but it's you know in a way that uh, if your students are more artistically inclined or visually inclined, that I'll, I mean I wish. I had a visual representation of this stuff that was moving and in 3D and a 3D vector with a neat holographic thing. I had a book and I was not super engaged with it, which led to the struggle with learning all this stuff later. Uh, but yeah, they love that that map because it's just, it's such a, an interesting uh, exploration of, of these basic math concepts. And really it's, it's a, you know, for those that are watching that are, wondering because we get this question a lot how do i teach tech artists what do i teach students so that they can become tech artists people want a lot of tech artists in the industry and we hear this term a lot and this math hallway is really a great example of uh you know what what a tech artist does oftentimes taking these technical concepts and making something prettier with them <laughs> let me step back be through math let me step back just a minute. Uh, you know, so let's say, you know, since we're, you know, very much focused in an educational type stream, let's say you are a student in a college, and maybe you're in a game program, maybe you're in an architecture mode program, maybe you're in a film program, maybe you're in an audio program, right? Um, and you know, sometimes these programs in an academic institution, whether it's a college, you know, community college, or maybe you're in a secondary education uh, institution they don't offer math, you know, or maybe they did or something like that. Um, and yet you're faced with a working in Unreal Engine project and, and you find yourself in a situation where you are stepping up to be the, the technical person on the project that you're working on. Uh, and you're having to figure out how to do stuff in the engine, uh, whether it's a material, a blueprint or whatever. Um, 
clearly, you know, you guys and, and Ryan, you already shared a, a site where you you sort of did that, and you already talked about sort of looking through. You know, Simon, you talked about jumping into some of the material nodes and that sort of stuff. Um, and and we've sort of gone into this, uh, you know, discussion about math in general. Uh, I think that there's a possibility that a lot of people don't know that the, that that is a, a lot of it that goes into technical art. You know, but as you're working through building what you're trying to build, and you're looking through the examples that that come from Epic, um, you know, let's say you're in a game program and you're just trying to get some really decent results and you're trying to elevate the quality of the projects that you're working on and you find yourself, you know, just solving problems and math just happens to be on it. Are there other places that you recommend uh, that they go to, to, you know, to try and find the solutions to this? Are there, you know, other programs or other things that, that help people understand, you know, how to get to the art or the visual that they're trying to achieve, you know, through the material system or, you know, through the terrain system or the, the you know, Niagara or whatever the case is. Because now these these parts of the engine are, are really deep in, in, in math and, and, and uh, you know, physically based content, which is very math heavy, right? Does that make sense, the question I'm trying to ask? Because I think a lot of these programs don't have deep math programs in many ways. Are you saying what, what are good resources? What Sorry, are good right. resources and how do they solve those challenges? Because um, I think that, um, you know, I'm aware of a lot of uh, other schools that don't have, you know, a lot of game programs don't offer a lot of math, you know? Architecture. The resources programs. I recommend would be uh, Nigo Quiles' website. He has a lot of articles and, and blog posts on you know, some fairly, fairly heavy math that's a little bit more advanced, but it's, it's definitely a good source of inspiration. And, you know, he shows a lot of really clever techniques uh, having to do with things like integrations, things that most people probably won't have to do. Uh, and I would also, you know, I don't want to scare people away because there's a lot of things you can do, you know, that are mathy in sort of in material land without it being, you know, correct mechanical. A lot of things can be solved intuitively. And even if it's not the most 100% correct, accurate solution ever, you know, as long as you're getting the job done, you know, controlling some behavior through whatever formula you cook up, you know, a lot of times we're just sort of solving things best as we can, you know, and approximating them. You know, we call them hacks or we call them approximations mm -hmm. if we're being polite. Um, but, you know, you shouldn't always feel like you have to, you know, understand the physical equation behind everything that you're doing. You know, a lot of times, you know, we want to be correct when we're modeling things like shading, but a lot of times too, we're just manipulating curves and, you know, faking things with acceleration. So I, I would say it shouldn't really deter people from trying complicated things, but rather when you actually want to push something to the next level, solving it analytically and, and be a big optimization and bring a lot of quality to it. But it's, I wouldn't say that it's something that's required before you consider yourself a tech artist. I think there's plenty of other things you can push to. Yeah, I, I wanted to, what Ryan exactly was saying. So math, like I say, is my nemesis. And luckily, we have really good people in the company. Uh, I don't remember how many times I think Bill to help me out with a vector math. And uh, but it's it's even though sometimes you have to do this hack, like Ryan was seeing, and it, it became kind of instinctive. It's like it's like you you understand the step process to get what you want, and maybe you don't really understand the formula, or maybe you hack the formula to make it do what it want to do. But it's just about understanding. Okay. This is my problem, and I, I kind of get, oh, I will solve it. And it, it might, instead of going from A to Z directly, you might do like A, B, C, Z, but it still works. And, and <laughs> somebody else can, that has more the skill for it can, can look at it and, and then say, OK, you should probably do your math like that to make it more. But I think, at least on, on, on my side, a lot of things I'm doing is prototyping and really, really quick. So it's like something that you're going to build to show, okay, it's fun, it works, it, it does what it's supposed to do. And then somebody else can look also and help you get the actual physically correct formula or, or you know, or this kind of thing. But the more you do it and the more you solve problem, something like a few years ago, dot product was scaring me. And now I use it without thinking because it became more instinctive. You know, it's like, it's like you know, this is the way it should go. And then I think it comes more by the experience of like, you know, hacking things together and then getting feedback from other people. 
one of the things that did help me a lot was, uh, I think it was Bill started that with David at Epic was this math course thing that you guys did like mm -hmm. math work. And yes. then there was a, as a resource, I would also, uh, there was a talk from you, Ryan, actually, I think it was a GDC talk where you went through explaining what the sign actually does, but visually with a ball jumping. And this helped me, me not being like math, math genius, helped me visualize, okay, sign does that and cosine does that and, and start understanding how I can actually use that to my advantage instead of being something that blocks you and that scares you it's something that become another tool in your tool belt and uh so i, I wouldn't like like ryan was saying wouldn't be like get that scare actually it's more fun than anything else at mm. the end yes i'm looking at the at the slack chat the stream chat somebody posted freya's uh channel that's an awesome resource um Simon mentioned the math for artists thing. So that was an initiative we actually started internally at Epic. We did three classes to try to demystify and help people um, kind of break down those walls, those those fears uh, of of, um, of math and how they were getting in your way and how you can actually utilize them. So that actually turned into a legit public thing. So um, if we have a link, uh, we, we had a class that probably went on for like two hours. I would, I would check it out. It's on YouTube. Um, outside of I mean, there's the obvious things to your question, Lewis, about, um, you know, you can just use the Unreal Epic forums, right? Like that's a great place to try to ask questions if, if you're getting stuck and it, it's, a, it's, you know, it's rolling the dice. Hopefully somebody sees it mm -hmm. and can, get, can understand the question you're trying to ask. Um, one thing personally I've noticed is like, as we get really, really deeper with like, especially Niagara, a lot of the potential we already have with Blueprints, for example, we're really kind of chasing what a lot of programs like Houdini do in film. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, I, I watched um, a tutorial about uh, caustics and, and Voronoi and stuff like that in mm -hmm. Houdini. And that stuff literally can translate into Niagara now with particles, right? Um, if you're completely new, it would probably be a little bit of a learning curve. But if you have a little bit of experience and you can translate that math, the numbers are, you know, math is universal, right? It, it works the same way uh, between programs. So one way to grow, I would encourage, is looking at you know, other programs, uh, what they're doing in film, um, even other game engines, if you have to, you know, a great way to grow. Yeah, and I think one of the reasons we wanted to have this stream is because the demand for technical artists is just growing exponentially, right? You know, every, and we hear this all the time at Epic that, you know, pretty much every film studio, architecture firm, automotive company, you know, uh, game company, it's just, desperate for more technical artists because, you know, technical artists will solve the problems. You know, what do you guys do? You make the game run at frame rate, you make it prettier, you make it work, you make it, you know, uh, do what it needs to do. You make it ship, whatever, you know, not that everyone else doesn't do that too, but, you know, in, in many cases, you know, throw a small army of technical artists at something and, and, you know, you can get it to run on this device and this, that, and the other thing. Um, and, uh, and, you can make it look the way it needs to look as well, right? Because it's that marriage of tech and art. And um, and so I think the one of the things that everything's, you know, at least in Unreal becoming more physically based. And then, you know, there are other tools, right? You know, you mentioned Houdini, but, you know, you know, Quixel and Substance and, and many of these other things. And I think that a lot of educators are sort of looking at Unreal and looking at Houdini and Substance and Quixel and, and many of the other tools. And, and realizing that there's more um, math, there's more uh, of this sort of technical aspect to these things that are really required and more technical art. And so that's one of the reasons we wanted to have the stream is, you know, what is it, what, what are the relevant skills and what do I need to learn and what do I need to teach? Um, you know, there's more and more Houdini coming into, you know, Unreal Engine and that sort of stuff. And that's another, you know, very intense technical program. Uh, that I think there's new opportunities opening up all the time as well. Like you yeah. mentioned before, when I started doing this at Epic, a technical artist really meant more like someone who helped out technical animation rigging. So there wasn't even the concept of tech art doing environments and art doing materials or any of that. Uh, and you know, now we have this might even be worth mentioning we have technical artists of almost every different type at Epic. We have tech artists who specialize in Houdini and procedural methods. We have tech artists who specialize in um, simulation and, and uh, Ni Niagara 
pushing Niagara along with the, the, the tech artists and the effects team like Bill and a couple other guys. Um, there's tech artists completely on the enterprise side who specialize in film mm -hmm. and, and basically dedicated content creation app workflows and pipeline and things like that. So there's some fairly widespread um, diversity in tech art skills these days. Uh, so I would say that you know the thing that you might have an opportunity three, four years down the road might not even exist yet. In some ways, it's up to us to find those new opportunities where you know, there's new work needing to be done or there's new help that can be can be given on certain areas. Um, so yeah, I'm excited always to see the new things that are coming out. And right now we're we're heading into the next generation. <laughs> you know, we've we've got the new consoles coming out. We got Unreal Engine Five coming out. Um, so it's it's definitely next gen -y. Uh That that feeling is here. Uh, that, that 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 time span seems to take longer and longer between the generations. It's pretty exciting. And um, you know, uh, talking about like Niagara and simulation and a lot of these topics. Do you guys have any advice or insight into if, if you were going to start in school right now or you were in school and watching the stream or you wanted to you're teaching what kind of skills and what kind of software whatever like what should you be thinking about as what i want to be a next gen tech artist i want to capture that that zeitgeist and, and do next gen stuff what should i be doing right now prepare other than math other than <laughs> learning dot product and sine wave which <laughs> which is pretty important <laughs> all you need is an unreal engine that's it <laughs> <laughs> it'll, it'll do it all for you <laughs> and an unreal engine yeah. and next gen tech artist I, I think i think a bit of scripting that either is max script or mail or python i mean it doesn't yeah. have to be really deep in there but it really helped me a lot uh, so before joining epic i was at fxtd and so that's what I was doing all day was Max script and uh, why it doesn't translate one to one. I think this the the learning a scripting language and the the logic that comes with it and the way to solve problem might might be helpful into translating it at least on the blueprint side. I would say. Yeah. And since you mentioned simulation, and since you mentioned simulation as well, you know definitely Houdini and Vex. Uh, it seems like everyone we've hired who's has expertise in simulation and, and fluids from film. Know, that has started learning Houdini and did a lot of cool tech demo examples in Houdini because that just seems like it's becoming the norm for you know, really custom fluid solves and you know crazy effects you know whereas four or five years ago it was everyone was doing you know Blender or White Frost or Maya fluid it seems like I mean more normal for people to do it in Houdini when it comes to big big budget effects I don't know Bill do you do you agree with that or do you have anything else to add there Oh yeah, I mean it's the standard now. I mean, I don't, I don't know of anybody who's in film that's that's still doing stuff in Fume or or Bifrost, like you were saying. Um, wow. And and a lot of that power comes from with Vex. It's you know that visual scripting language. Um, to to Simon's point, Python too. Like I watch uh, Bryce at work. You know, he comes up with these crazy scripts that can harvest. You know, even from like an optimization standpoint, like. Uh, give a little bit of context in Fortnite, you know, static mesh might have collision data on it that it doesn't need. And it might seem trivial because it's like 200 kilobytes, right? But we are strapped. You know, we support everything from phones to, you know, newer hardware, new console hardware, right? So it's like got 100,000 static meshes we need to harvest through. He writes Python scripts that can be like, okay, I'm looking for things that have been re-imported re recently and have this stuff that shouldn't be there. And then we can target the artist or the content creator and be like, okay, we need to strip this out. So there's just so much power mm -hmm. uh, with tools like that. I can go on and on, but that's just one example mm -hmm. uh, that came to mind. So, and there there was a, there's some questions, a lot of questions in the chat that are, and it happens a lot with tech artists. Is if if I'm learning Python, am I a tech artist? If I'm doing X Y Z, am I a, a tech artist? And uh, you know, from my perspective. It's kind of a common joke, like when tech artists meet, you're like, hey, what do you do? I'm a tech artist. Oh, cool. I'm a tech artist too. So what do you do? Like, it's <laughs> such a broad category that really, um, you know, as long as you're kind of in that that middle space and anymore, it almost seems like 
everyone needs to be a little bit of an artist. Like you can't, you, you no longer can just, we're, we're past the days where like, like someone was saying earlier, like my first art test was to build a tank that had like one texture on it, and like, you know, 300 triangles. And I, I was responsible for the whole thing and getting the thing to move. That was all like, that was me. Um, and, and so, you know, it wasn't terribly technical. I needed to know how to get Photoshop to make a 256 by 256 texture uh, in the right color space. And that was kind of it. Um, <laughs> and, and now, you know, a character or a, just an environmental prop, like you know, a concrete bollard is a thousand times more complicated than a tank used to be. <laughs> And I think uh, it's perfectly valid as an avenue of tech art, and it just really depends on the project and the needs of the team that they're working on. I've been to full-on, you see, tech art talks that are mostly about, you know, pipeline and JSON and XML files. You know, there's a lot of games out there who they yeah. might not be using things like blueprints and asset libraries. They might have a database and they might have a giant XML file or, or something else where they're describing hit points and uh, attributes and things like that. And they just need someone who can help marshal that content and validate that it's getting translated into the game correctly. I mean, it, it's unclear who, who that might be. It could be a gameplay guy, but it could also be a tech artist who has a specialty in, in uh, pipeline content, scripting, in my opinion. I think it's valid. It's just really, it really depends. Yeah, I've been to GDC talks that are, that are branded as tech art talks about water and stuff like that. I went to a few years ago and I'm, it was just legit straight up rendering talk. Like it was super low level render stuff. And I'm just like, okay, this is like way above my head. This is way too granular for, for my taste. So that adds to the frustration of what a technical artist is. Um, to add to what you were kind of saying, Tom, uh, you do have to be like a Jack or Jill of all trades. If you're a tech artist, like you really do have to be able to tackle most any problem. Uh, and like Ryan was saying, like you're kind of the Swiss army knife of whatever project you're on. So that's really important is to be able to be um, diverse in that, in, in that aspect. It's like there is a problem and they don't really know to, who needs to solve that problem. So usually that will be the tech artist. Yeah, we, we don't have time for a rendering engineer to fix this properly. So yeah. can we send uh, a tag your it. <laughs> yeah. So I but mean, your solution out. can piss off the, the rendering engineer really quickly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, so with that in mind, uh, I know you guys have some, some uh, things that you might want to share. Are, are you guys uh, up for it? Ryan, you ready? You want to show some, some other cool stuff? Uh, this is just some experimental stuff. Uh, with clouds that I've already shared a little bit on, on Twitter. But, you know, just, just for fun. And this is something that you know, uses the new volumetric cloud system um, inside of the engine that Sebastian Hilaire added. Um, and then also a little bit of UI polish and started working with uh, Asher Zoo, one of our other tech artists who added this UI stuff. Basically just playing around with the idea that you could come in here and paint clouds inside the editor viewport come in and erase them. And this is all just like a blueprint that's doing this. So we can actually uh, click on this texture here to see that we're painting this texture as we, and that texture. You gotta share your just, screen, Ryan. Oh, did I forget to share uh, I was screen? just wondering. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's <laughs> oh you know what? I've got the uh, share uh, notification up. My bad, let me. Uh -huh. Everybody use your imaginations. We're going Thank on you. a journey. Magic, <laughs> magic school bus. <laughs> <laughs> all right, is that better? Part of tech kind of, yes. is communication skills. All right, yes, thank you. All right, now, so this is a blueprint. It's doing some, some uh, sky painting. Of course, it's got my screen share. You know what? We've had this focus problem before. Oh, there it goes. Oh, I'm showing know. up. Oh, yeah. there, there's some, yeah. some bug with editor focus where it doesn't always get the focus when you use screen share. But um, so this is a blueprint that's doing painting inside the sky. Um, Click on this little texture here, and then as we're painting, we'll see you know the uh, wow. paint strokes showing up in there. Cool. Um, we can paint some different things like flow maps. Right now, we're just kind of painting the density. We can change the mode to uh, velocity, and come in here and go. Cool. Come in and, and paint these brush strokes. 
so I didn't have time to prepare a nice painted canvas or anything like that, but I think you get the idea that, you know, just it, this is the type of thing that you can do just in Blueprints now where you're drawing to a render target and then plugging that render target into another asset, which is driving uh, the clouds. Um, so it's just an example of how with, with the texture, you can kind of start to drive global scene properties now. Uh, so it's pretty much just one more step to try to tie that into weather. You know, Unreal Engine doesn't yet have a prepackaged built-in weather solution. So that's the type of thing that, you know, a tech artist is usually going to help set up on a different project. Um, and, you know, that's something that we will probably add at some point, but even then you're probably going to still need a tech artist to actually be the one who owns the for a game. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, games have different things like rain might need to be included from awnings or indoors versus outdoors or puddles might need to have vehicles make splashes. You know, there's just things like that that you're always going to have. Probably you need, need a tech artist to help marshal it through to the end. So that, that was a fun little uh, cloud painting example. Um, Ryan, uh, what you just said there, I think, is really interesting. Is is like you know you're showing something that's like mind blowing, and and the the thought of like creating something like that is is you know it's just pretty high level. Let's call it high level. Um, but like you were saying, even if you you're like I can't build something like that, there there's a, a tech artist job out there for someone who will take that system that we ship. That you've created and will make it work for the project at hand at the game the simulation or whatever so even if you don't know how to actually make a volumetric cloud render with ray marching yada yada knowing how to use that tool and get the most out of it get the most performance make it look right i think we were talking earlier about kind of being the put the 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 person who Kind of figures how stuff works and then acting as a resource for people. So when they go, Hey, how do we make the cloud swirl? You can be like, Oh, yeah, here, let me show you how to do it. Let me figure that out and then I'll show you tomorrow. Um, exactly. That's, that's very much a, a level of tech art. You know, you don't have to be all the way at like, I am making the rain marching shader in HLSL. That's totally a tech artist too, I think. Borderline rendering engineer. <laughs> Sometimes you get a little dangerously close, but certainly I think there's a, there's a lot of people out there, and that's kind of what they do is take the tools and, and mm. apply them to solve problems. And, and sometimes evolve the tool, right? Like uh, maybe I'm completely wrong, but uh, were you at some point uh, you know involved in the prototyping of like the the new sky atmosphere systems or or some of the things that became later on you know heart, more code based features? You know you. And if sometimes so you guys prototype. prototype, yeah, I, I did a separate prototype of a Raymarch cloud um, that was, you know, just it was a nested Raymarch that did shadowing in the Raymarch, so it was pretty expensive, uh, and it wasn't something that you could ship on consoles for. Uh, but then the push to actually make that a real system came because of the PlayStation Five demo. Mm. Um, so uh, Sebastian Hilaire, who we hired uh, about a year and a half, two years ago. Uh, he implemented a new volumetric cloud rendering system, which, which basically just lets you define the clouds using a material graph. So you just give it a density shape, uh, and then the cloud actor, you tell it the altitude that you want. Um, so, so we definitely worked closely together during that because, you know, in, in the beginning, it wasn't entirely clear which controls needed to be exposed uh, to be able to hit the same targets that I was getting in the prototype. Uh, so it went back and forth, but I mean, you know, for the most part, Sebastian is kind of the industry leading expert on cloud rendering. So he really mm. knew what he was doing. Right. And it's more like he needed some, some experience in, in how do you make this fit perfectly in Unreal's ecosystem? You know, how does this plug perfectly into Unreal so that it just works nicely and brings all of his rendering expertise? And, you know, there were a few little improvements working together we found for, for some of the scattering of approximations and, and things. But that, that was mostly him on the, on the back end, you know, much more optimized. So I still think it was valuable. Um, having that opportunity to work alongside him. Like, and then, you know, like Tom was saying, we, we took that and applied it to um, some, some other elements of, of uh, other projects internally, like Fortnite cinematics and things like that. And that involved other tech artists kind of downloading some of that knowledge that we had built on the PlayStation 5 demo and in, in starting with those materials, but then rebuilding them, changing the artistic style by changing the textures. So it's not like they started from zero when, when it's like, how do we use this new cloud system? They're like, okay, we have a cool sky from the PS5 demo. Take that, have a meeting with Ryan and learn how that works, and then we'll manipulate it, you know, how we need to on top of that. 
And so mm-hmm. we're always trying to hand off the torch and, and you know, it's, it's like running a uh, relay race, right? You're, you're handing off the thing to the next guy to take it further. Right. That's pretty cool. That's actually, so you serve as a designer in some ways, product designer. Yeah. I mean, we, we end up reusing these little bits of R and D between projects, but obviously we don't, we can't assign people who've worked on these bits of R and D to integrate them to every project. There's too many things going on. So yeah, yeah. what we'll do is just quick little meetings where you know, we'll, we'll have the person who's going to implement have a chance to ask any questions, and figure it out. And you know, then we communicate and make ourselves available as Fantastic. Bill, how about yourself? You, you, uh, I know that you've got some stuff to, to share as well. Do you? Let me share a screen. Please. You guys see that okay? It's coming through. Now. Okay. There it is. So Ooh. I'm going to give a, a little bit of an impromptu oh, wow. tutorial. We're going to talk a little bit about math. Just to give some context, um, how this came about, where I was. So this is about... Uh, close to a year ago now. So in 2019, I was pretty much solo uh, writing as like a technical artist slash effects artist on creative mode. So if you guys don't know what that is in Fortnite, it's the mode inside of Fortnite that lets you build effectively your own games, right? You get to be your own designer and you build these games and create the rules all inside of, of the game itself. And then you and you start the mode where you can share it with other people. So I wasn't doing a lot of effect stuff. Niagara was really coming along um, with new features. And I was towards the end of the year kind of feeling bummed that I wasn't pushing myself learning the tool. So I wanted to push myself personally and do a little bit of a project where I can see, you know, what happens if I uh, try to come up with this idea where um, I simulate an electromagnetic field simulator inside of Niagara and how those particles can move and can I actually get the visual result I wanted. So where should I start? Actually, I'm going to just give two quick visual examples. I'll leave this... um, I'll copy this actually and put this in the chat. Uh, you know what, I'm not logged in, but if somebody can do that for me. Um, this is a little charge and field simulator. It looks like it's from uh, a school out in Colorado. And what it does is it allows you to put charges in a 2D field and it visualizes, you can see the um, directional vectors of the charges, right? So the basics of magnetism or electromagnetism are you know, positive charges go away, uh, negative charges kind of um, attract and that opposite charges, those fields will be attracted to each other. So if I put a negative charge in here, right, you can see that the um, field lines going from the positive charge are attractive toward this uh, blue negative charge. I recommend this tool. It's really cool. It's really fun uh, to use as a visualizer. And you can actually use things like voltage, which shows you um, the color for positive and negative. And then you can sample values with this little, um, I don't know what you would call it. Oh, that's the distance tool. It says the equipotential. I've never even heard that term before, right? But you can see as I am measuring, right, I'm just basically sampling at some point in a 2D uh, vector field how much charge this has, how strong this is. So we break down the math, and I have to give David Hill credit for helping me uh, figure this out, even though it's really not too complicated once you break it down. But this all uses something called Coulomb's Law. And Coulomb's Law basically uh, tells us the force between two charged particles, right? So a positive and negative. And we can see the equation here. Maybe I can make this a little bigger here. Which force equals um, Coulomb's constant, which it, and then um, your two charges times each other divided by the uh, distance squared between the charges. And to make it simpler, you can see if I can annotate it. We don't even need that guy right there. Really, all we need because we're not trying to convert this into some kind of physical force that's physically accurate, right? We can just kind of magic number it. We can increase numbers as we want. But really, all we need is. Um, the breakdown here is uh, charge one times charge two divided by the uh, distance square. So again, I'm coming into Niagara here, pretty new. I hadn't touched it in probably over a year and a half or something like that. So I thought I want to be able to prove the math out in something I do know, which is the material editor. Give me one second so I can clear this. I need to see those green squiggles the whole time. There we go. <laughs> so. What I did was I've got a, a, a simple plane here and I'm repeating this little arrow over the plane, it's basically world space tiling. And I'm feeding in these positions and they just have a strength that I'm just, again, randomly picking. And then I'm feeding that into a material and then basically rotating each quadrant that we're repeating the arrow to see if I can, again, uh, emulate the math, right? So 
it worked after a few tries, I can uh, push and pull the different charges and the arrows themselves rotate. And I can show the math and the material. It's probably not gonna make a whole lot of sense, but if anybody wants to copy it really quick, take a screenshot. But again, a lot of this is um, basically what we saw already, which is just a position, which we're feeding into what's called the material parameter collection. So wherever the, that little circle that you saw is in world space, we're gonna, we're gonna write that to this parameter collection. We're gonna subtract it, get the length, and then remember we want it squared, and then divide it by the charge strength, which in this case, it's not gonna be one. I think it's actually a little harder, uh, or higher, excuse me. And then I'm multiplying it by something called the, the normalized vector, which I'll explain in a second. So cool, that works. So the next step is I wanna be able to take it inside of Niagara. So Whoa. what I've got here are two charges. I've got a positive and negative, and I can feed these values whatever I want uh, or set them to whatever I want them to be. So in this case, I'm actually using 500,000 and negative 500,000. So again, if I want to do physically accurate things, like for example, we know that charges are attracted to opposite charges. What if I set them both to positive? Would they repel? And you can see that they do. And I'm using some, uh, uh, what are they called again? I'm sorry, scratch pad modules inside of Niagara to be able to actually color pick so that if I'm positive, I stay uh, uh, red, and if they're negative, they're blue. So I can, you know, just futz with these numbers. I can make really, really, really strong. Oh, that looks really harsh. I'm going to go ahead and change it to unlit. Maybe I'll go back to a lower number. There we go. Maybe we'll make this to negative 900,000 or something like that. So you can see as the charges become imbalanced, you can see that it starts to actually kind of introduce some cooler shapes, right? Where one kind of sucks in really quick to the other, but you can see the blue one, the negative charge actually gets repelled uh, quicker. I shouldn't say repelled, it's actually got more force, so it shoots past the positive charge. So in this case, um, you know, I just said, hey, let's just make this fun. Let's see how far it can go. I went ahead and added four charges to see them interacting. And you can see how they start to dance around each other. And these are physically accurate. I'm controlling these with a blueprint. It's a little goofy there. I'm sorry, I've got to figure out what's going on. But I have this little utility that just randomizes the positions and then randomizes the strengths. And you can see that every time you randomize it, you get some really cool, you know, it's kind of dancing lines. That's the only best way I can describe it. But, you know, it worked out. What it's doing here is we've got, I can break it down just a little more and then I'll bring it back to, to Simon. We've got little GPU particles that are using the same math to um, basically repel from their source from a spherical point. And then it's calculating all the different field charges around it. And it's as it's iterating through space, it's saying, it's running that equation. It's saying, how strong is my pull towards those other charges? So here are some of the positive charges you can see getting sucked in. Now, the ribbons work by, if I can isolate these, you know what, it's gonna take a bit of time because Niagara's a bit slow with all these, uh, all these different emitters that I have. But just to break it down, what's happening is that I have these kind of source particles that you actually don't see. They're invisible because I've set their size to zero. They emanate from their different points here. And as they traverse through space, they generate an event that talks to another emitter. And that one has a ribbon render, a ribbon render is just kind of this flat quad that's camera face, the camera face, excuse me. And then it just draws behind it. You can see it's taking that lead particle and then drawing a ribbon behind it. And then it just stays persistently so it can um, be visible for about maybe like a hundred seconds or something like that. So that's my little experiment that I did. I have a lot more I wanna do with this. I'm not really happy with the art side of it. And I wanna be able to see this update in, three, uh, in real time, meaning that as the charges move, the ribbons charge, the ribbons change with them. But um, it's a cool little experiment um, that I just did on my spare time. So that is super cool. Thanks. I can only imagine what uh, Einstein would do with something like this. Because <laughs> that looks like that looked like gravity. <laughs> that, you know, that looks like a, a, a universal model of, of gravity or something like that. Yeah, it it produces really really cool. I've got tons of videos when I was playing with it. It produces really cool visual results that are fun. I was trying to ride a long time ago, and he's like, "You should do like a solar simulator, like yeah. solar flares." 
and stuff like that off of like a, a noise texture. I just haven't had time, unfortunately, but hopefully soon. That's super awesome. Uh, I, um, I yeah, I can imagine people getting their hands on that and playing around and doing some beautiful like uh, solar system type, all kinds of things. And I really, I really enjoy taking real world stuff like that, like magnetic projectiles, and like real forces, and trying to get, trying to get Unreal to to do them. Uh, it's really satisfying when when it actually works, and and it looks so satisfying too. Because I think you know our eyes pick up on that, and so when you see that, you know it looks like a solar flare. It looks magnetic because it is. Uh, yeah. It's you know taking that that little bit of extra, like oh well, we could make these particles go close, and, you know, suck between these. Well, why don't we actually get the magnetic, uh, you know, actually get the right math. Uh, and when you do, it just it looks so satisfying and so beautiful. Like you're like, oh, I'm not happy with the art. Meanwhile, everyone, oh wow, <laughs> <laughs> I want to play with that. Where can I get that? Well, that's got to be one of the most <laughs> gratifying parts about uh, you know that marriage of of art and tech is that you know in a physically based tool set, you're, you're not trying to force the art. You just uh, can put in appropriate values and. When you look at it, you're like, "Well, that looks right because it probably is right, right?" And uh, unless it's wrong and or wrong math, in which case you're like, "Hmm, I don't know," right? And and then if you get the the math right or you know the equations right, then you can look at it and go, "Well, it is right," you know, it uh, it, it should be right there because it's it's working the way it should work. And you know, the bill of three four years ago would have just faked all that. You know what I mean? Yeah, like. We can be good artists that makes that make really good curvy lines that look aesthetically pleasing, but that if it's like okay, now make that up that real time. Exactly, like, you know, Tom Lewis, <laughs> like you're saying, it's like you need to know the math behind it, you know, and let the computer do the work. Well, and now the computers can do a little more work than they used to. I mean, we used to have to fake everything. <laughs> uh, and now we can actually like throw a little more math at the computer than we used to. Um, so I wonder, I wonder how much of it is the computers allowing us to, like, you know, there was a time where I wouldn't even consider throwing kind of math. And, you know, I had other things at those frame rates uh, to be fed to. So who came first, the chicken? Yeah, it's so cool to to have that ability. And Niagara, and, and then, you know, it feeds back into the next gen discussion. Uh, is and 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 also into this like marriage of games and Hollywood and Houdini and, and like what is next and and it, I think a lot of it really is that like like taking taking the stuff that people have been doing already offline and at this very high level that was considered impossible to do at real time before and now it's it's suddenly quite possible doing fluid dynamics at real time to uh you know magnetics at, at real time and all of the you know things that we just we just faked it before or we didn't do it at all like a couple of bones and a constraint that's good enough just don't let it move fast enough and it'll be good um, <laughs> so uh I guess, I guess the point is just really uh how 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 we now have this this all of this extra power the computational power we have kind of more knowledge available to us uh, and, and and the tools now to to let us kind of take this, like you showed, here's a page of math and half of the people on the chat ran away and the others went, yay, <laughs> math. Uh, I, I'm the runaway guy <laughs> when I see those equations. Uh, but, and that's, that's really, I think, where things are moving toward as we can take less, mm -hmm. we're starting to look more at scientific papers and go, oh, what can I pull pull out there? How can we make this more physically accurate? You know, running PBR in real time six years ago was not really something that was considered feasible. And now it's just kind of, I run it on my phone. Yeah, well, I mean, you, you play it, whatever, you know, games like uh, the Assassin's Creed's or you know, any of the games where they're blowing up massive cities or you watch the movies where, the, you know, a, 
a huge lizard is walking through Manhattan and, you know, buildings are exploding, you know, the suspension of disbelief requires, you know, physically accurate destruction of buildings and, you know, uh, explosions or whatever the case is, you know, when the Avengers come swooping down, if, if it doesn't look physically accurate, it, uh, kind of takes you out of the experience. So that's translating into, you know, these real time tool sets at, at, uh, at a very rapid rate. And a lot of that is because it, becoming so much more physically accurate. And, and I think, you know, that's what we're looking at here, you know, with chaos and, and the engine and Niagara and, and, you know, cloud rendering and water and air and, and everything else. Right. Um, you know, just to keep things moving along, uh, I, I don't know how many of you in the chat, uh, have been following, uh, Simon's stuff on Twitter, but he's been <laughs> posting some really cool stuff. Uh, and, uh, uh, hopefully he's going to share some of it with us because I know I've been following some of his stuff on Twitter. And if you haven't, I encourage you to check it out because uh, I, I look at it and I'm like, what is going on there? That is super exciting. Uh, would you share some of that with us? Yeah, sure. So uh, let me share my screen. I hope it does work. I changed my resolution. So, okay. Can you guys see my screen? I cannot see you anymore. So I'm. Yes. So, yep. so yeah, I, I kind of wanted to like. You know about the learning and things like that. At first, I wanted to show some tools, but like one of the things I, I like to do to try to keep up, I'm not as a math uh, uh, great as uh, Bill or Ryan is, but I like to, what I do is that if I see something that I find interesting, then I want to kind of like take it apart and try to reproduce it, to redo it. So it's and then take it a bit further than where it was when I saw it. So one of the things was like at the presentation of the PS5, there was this vegetation grow thing. So um, I look at it and I was like, okay, I want to I want to redo that with Unreal. So that's a bit of material work, a bit of blueprint work, and a bit of stuff like that. So the idea was like, okay, I can do that step. So now I want to take it a bit further. So I'm like, okay, I want the pond to control where this is happening. So when I move, then it grows the vegetation based of where the actual pond is. And I thought that, okay, that's, that's kind of fun. So now I want to take it a bit further and I start having the pond painting where the vegetation will grow. So wherever it shoots, it's basically painting um, render target and uh, the vegetation grow where it's supposed to be. But this is kind of like what I, I was saying, like in general tech artists really want to take apart thing and figure out how they're working and how they can replicate something. Um, I got a bit carried away at the end. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it's just really fun to do. It's, as, it's completely useless, but doing that taught me a lot of things. Um, and the great thing is that it stayed there. So if you want to pay in your 40 edge like that, you can. Um, and then I, I went a bit further and I did that in the HoloLens. So I can paint using the spatial mapping from the HoloLens so it can see uh, the room in my place. And then what I do is that I line trace through the mesh so I know where, where I'm doing that. So this is the kind of small experiment and I try to do that at least once a week and it's it kind of keep keep you fresh kind of um you know where you 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 keep you have to keep learning stuff and you have to keep up to date on what's happening um is that a dreamcast is that, in your video hmm? is that a dreamcast in your video by the way uh it is i'm trying to put the <laughs> hdmi cable uh, yeah there trying to put the <laughs> hdmi cable in in there but sorry for the mess um <laughs> The other thing I've been, so every time I do this kind of like little step uh, and what, what I like to do is try to understand and what I think is, is also important for tech artists is that they need to understand the whole workflow or, or everything works, like what the pawn is doing, what the controller is doing, what, you know. So when you have to do things that interact with each other, at least more where the direction I'm going, uh, I can I can start hacking things and connecting things together. So. With my wife, I've been watching this thing called Cabaneri, which is a story about zombie. So 
I wanted there is this big monster at the end that is made out of small zombies. So I thought like, okay, I, I want to see if I can do that in Unreal and if it can run. <laughs> so I start doing that. <laughs> uh, so it's money there, multiple money, and then you can shoot them. Uh, so that was the first test where you can shoot them and then physics takes over. And then after a while, they disappear from the floor <laughs> and regrow uh, on the body. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> Great material war work, as you can tell. Uh, but all of that are prototype just to, to like, makes me, make, make me understand things. So I was like, okay, this is great. Now I want to, don't have to shoot them. I want them that with the first collision, they, I want to drive skeletal mesh. And then in the first collision that they hit, then they start to go physics. And then when they're on the floor, I want to convert that to, I love the behavior tree in, in UE4. So I want them to start having their own, you know, uh, personality and then start chasing the player. <laughs> I so love I the glowing the eyes. Thing, oh. And then I, I kind of keep connecting things on top of each other and, and try to find a bit of every discipline. You know, it's a bit of animation, it's a bit of blueprint, it's a bit of material. So. When I did that, I was like, okay, now I really want to shoot them. So my skill in Niagara are nowhere, so I need to learn Niagara. So I thought that was a good idea to use that. So I made a little better mood, not anymore, like just hide and use the same blueprint that generate all the, the money and the, the physics, the mannequin and the physics. But now I wanted to shoot them and something happened. So you have like guys so when they hit the border they drop and they break and then they stand when they want to wake up they go and then they chase the player but now you can shoot them so when i shoot them i spawn a niagara emitter that takes the skeletal mesh because i really wanted to learn how to do that and when they hit the floor for the first time they basically become particles so it's it's about taking like every time a little extra step into and then adding something that you are not sure how to do. So you kind of have to figure it out. So when during the job it comes up, then you like, yeah, I've done that. So I kind of know where to go to do that. Um, there is. Uh, so I, I there is like some tools uh, using actually Rand's help on that. Basically, a material that's used distance field. So when you push it through, it simulate that kind of bump in the mesh, like it would be sand. So you can move, and then it, it, the mesh actually deform, uh, and you can see where where it's happening. So I try to do one of these at least once a week. Just keep keep learning new thing, and and I think that uh, UE4 is really really nice for that. Is that you don't really need to know how to code or how to do kind of thing, so it's useful. So here was another tool. We needed a spline decal. So I basically use a decal, but it's uh, procedurally generated. So it's a procedural mesh. So you can decide, you know, like if you want less, less uh, edges and all of that. And then you can use basically a spline as decal. Uh, so kind of a, a lot of this small tool and you can switch you know so i'm the tech artist would try i think to make it friendly for the actual artist to use it so you can switch modes so there is a lot of option you can use a splatter more where you would splatter plenty of stuff and then combine them there was a other small tool um there was this that i just learned is actually in the engine so we i didn't actually need to build that but uh Editor blueprint are really, really nice because you can build a lot of things to get rid of the not so fun task. You know, you, you don't want to spend hour merging or so what this tool does is basically it takes all the mesh that are the same and just convert it to an instant static mesh. So even though they were all different uh, static meshes, now they're just one instance. And then playing with other things. Unfortunately, I cannot play the music here there is this really good thing but this one i think i can play the music it's a free music so it's basically using synesthesia to separate stem and have like object moving with the music 
So all of that is procedural. I can drop any music in there and then it would just work. It's cool. Yeah. So each blueprint is driven from a specific type of sound. For what it's worth, we can't hear the music. Oh, you I'm cannot sure. hear the music? No. Oh, then, well, it's it's on LinkedIn, or I can post the link for the video. But basically, it's, it, it does that, that kind of thing. So, so, yeah, so that's a bit of the stuff I've, I've been working on. That's awesome. On, on the side of that, I also really like to replicate games, but that's less tech artist than gameplay. So when I see a game that I kind of like, I need to spend a night to... Okay, can I do it in UE4 and then copy that and do it in UE4? Oh, I've been doing this kind of thing. I mean, it's great to see that stuff. And it actually uh, brings up an interesting question. Uh, I, I imagine you guys probably are, you know, in, in the review process as people apply at Epic for Tech Art, you know. Uh, and I would imagine that that is a great example of some of the, the material that that someone in school or or whatever the case might be should be thinking about as they're preparing material uh, to apply as a tech artist someplace um you know what advice would you all give to someone who's aspiring to be a tech artist to assemble for a portfolio well we call it scrappiness is the is the term we use at epic right like i think it's something we've all demonstrated here it's like you you identify a problem and you're able to use the existing tools and your brains, right, to put them all together to come up with some solution. So we could come up with probably a thousand different examples. Um, rather than do that, personally, I would say, show that you found a problem and how you approached it, right? And you came up with a tool and solution um, and how it works, you know, things like that, so. I would say for me, it's especially if, it, if a portfolio demonstrates cross uh, discipline understanding, then that's also a big plus. Mm. Like for example, not just the most technical shader or not just the coolest, uh, you know, pre-rendered simulation effect, but you know, did, did this cool effect connect to blueprint? Did it connect to gameplay? Did they show that the different weapon strengths had a different reaction? You know, things like that can all go a long way toward, you know, in all these sort of prototypes where you're demonstrating different features being connected, I think those usually show pretty well for, for a tech artist. Yeah, that's great oh, advice. Problem, problem solving and and this, I, I think it's kind of like knowing a bit of everything and then slowly, slowly getting specialized in one area, but still understanding all the department. Like a tech artist should know or a skeletal mesh works and or, or lighting work and should he doesn't have to know it really deeply, but know it enough that if a problem comes, he, he knows how to access that and touch that. I mean, that is what I think. No bit of everything. Now you already talked about uh, Ryan, your relationship with Sebastian uh, Hillard uh, in working with the cloud systems. Uh, do you guys end up working much more closely with the engineers uh, in other ways? Uh, you know, like if there are gameplay programmers or, or rendering pro programmers, where you know, how do you define that? that point at which you should stop as a tech artist and you should pass the torch to, you know, an engineer or programmer, you know, is there a point at which you're like, yeah, this is beyond my skill or, you know, how do you, how do you know when to stop or when it's kind of too much or, um, or when it should be something that's solved in code as opposed to say blueprint or material editor or, or even the, the HLSL that you can write yourself. It usually comes down to performance and shippability on, on a case by case basis. You know, like we, we have things that are just quick little blueprint utilities, like what Simon showed, where you have a button that you press it and make something. And we use that in Fortnite to make parts of the map, for example. As long as it's not causing problems and becoming a bottleneck, you know, we don't really see anything wrong with that. Um, but you know, if we're trying to do something more on, on the material side that's slow and, and maybe it's identified as not being the most efficient way of doing things then it's really a better case to get someone from rendering it involved, especially if it's something that we need to do again and again uh, in Fortnite and, and in uh, the Unreal Engine. If it's something that's just meant to help 
if this special special project cinematic, for example, more likely to just tech arts. More something has to be uh, less to do that unless it just happens to work smoothly. Uh, it, it just depends. And for me, working directly with renders, that actually was probably common 10 plus years ago when we only had 100 people total at Epic. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then it was really like we were making gears and two or three rendering guys. So pretty much the need of what we were doing for gears at the time would find the agenda. But whereas now we have so many needs from licensing, the engine is so big that it, I wouldn't say that it's really our like one on one meetings anymore are really defining what needs to be done because it's much longer up in there's to take into it. But it still definitely comes into play for things like usability. Um, we're always looking for back side uh, on the blueprint side. How's how to expose things mm. the most intimidating? I would say you know we're always looking for back from technical artists. We're a good customer of those sort of things because we like right. to you know, noodle and poke all the edges of the box, like Tom was mentioning before. And Simon, you just really understand how it works, so that puts us in a good position to give her a feedback. But on the other hand, they also have to take that with a grain of salt because sometimes our feedback, we might be more willing to overlook or you know, put up with something, whereas someone who's not technically user may have a different feedback. So, you know, I would right. say our feedback is more important, but it's definitely important to help providing good tools. And I guess in the same breath, uh, when it comes to the art side, you know, is there a, t a point at which you're like, you know, it's not my job always to finish the art, you know, to pass it off to somebody who needs to finish the lighting, finish the, the, the final look dev of something, you know, is there a point at which you're like, I, I need to take the art this far, then hand it off to somebody else to conclude the art process? I'll say this much. I feel like art roles are a little more well-defined. Um, it's never it's never bad to be able to push it on the tech art side, but typically in my experience, tech art is almost always in support of some other artistic dis discipline. Um, it's very rare that, for example, working on like an emote in Fortnite or something like that, I'm not I'm not going to be responsible for uh, the the you know textures on the character, right? It's usually some level of like, oh, they need the character to do this when X happens, mm -hmm. or something like that. So it's all about um, you know working in tandem and harmony with someone else. I don't think it's a bad idea. I'll use the example of like environment art. I don't think it's a bad idea to to start drawing lines in the sand. At some point, you might, for example, um, approach a problem where it's like this this scene is so massive and complex. And to UV it, it's it would be a nightmare. It would be a time drain. It would be weeks to have somebody try to figure this out and texture it. Let's use, you know, smart material tricks to be able to do things like triplanar mapping or whatever, you know, and vertex coloring. How can we try to just quickly build this together to still provide, you know, a cohesive, aesthetically pleasing piece, but you know, again, letting the computer do the work for you in some instances, right? Right. So. Hopefully that's a good answer to your question. I don't know if that was too muddy, but it's a complicated question. You know, I know that okay, uh, so you guys worked on um, the the Fortnite cinematic. You know, where there were a lot of you know heavy tech art pieces that you know were the final bit or piece. You know, and I know you worked on Paragon, where there were foliage bits and pieces. You built tools for the the art. You know, and uh, probably some of them were used as is. Maybe I don't know. You know. Uh, so it, I know that there's a lot of the work that you do that is used as is probably, uh, you know, but it can be probably challenging for certain tech artists who are like, I built this thing to be done in this way. And then somebody's like, well, I want to do it this way or whatever. And it's got, it, it has to be some, probably at times a, a complicated balance of, you know, well, you know, you provide this to artists or you provide this, you know, from a design or, or a tech perspective and, Somebody else is going to be like, well, it doesn't work this way, or you know, I need to do this thing with it, and and uh, and so the role of a tech artist must be at times a balance and a complicated balance to to manage, and you have to be willing to give and take. Yeah, that's actually a good example of the Fortnite trailer. That was a case where uh, Bill and I worked pretty closely together. 
where I was doing most of the setup for the, the fluid sim and, and kind of setting up a working version of each shot. And then Bill would kind of come in, especially for the bigger, you know, key moments and really own the shot from there and totally tweak the forces in the sim, figure out how to inject some new forces, you know, go nuts with the color and the shadowing and that kind of stuff. So, so in that case, I really felt like I was there to provide a basis and then for him to push and polish on top of that. Uh, and again, with the PS5 demo, you know, a lot of it was setting up the clouds so that it could hit the artistic quality bar. But then once most of that work started to be done, um, so that a lot of the work was done from the um, San Francisco Larkspur office, whereas uh, most of us are here in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. you know, so once most of the R&D was done, you know, those guys kind of took that in-house and tweaked the composition of the final cloud place. So they didn't need to or they move clouds around. So that does happen sometimes. You, know, you help set up a framework and hand it off to other artists to polish or to just own because they're the ones who are going to be going to the dailies process and look at art director feedback. Because you, know, you know, if you just did all this technical R&D to, to develop something, sometimes it's too much to then also be on the hook for the dailies look dev right. final delivery. That can be a lot. You know, look dev and uh, final tweaks, so they can go for two weeks out of major cinematic. You know, that could be everyday revisions and everyday they don't like your tweaks and you're doing it again. So having someone work with on that stuff really helps. And, you know, at least for me, I've, I've usually worked with someone who's kind of like the designated artistic artist or artistic effects artist. And then I'll be the effects artist, or sorry, the, the technical artist to help complement them. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Uh -huh. I know what you were saying, Lewis, is, you know, communication is key, right? Part yeah. of being a professional, we're talking about so much of the, of like the the meat and potatoes of knowledge, you know, to what to being a technical artist, but like, yeah, we have to be professionals here. We have to, you know, work as a team and communicate those and those issues and iron them out, you know. And and the collaborative process in general, yeah. um, that gets so, lost. The reason I bring it up, like, a lot of students really overlook that. They think you can be this amazing badass that can come in and, you know, sweep sweep everybody's leg and you know dust off and, and walk away. It's like, no, we're all a team. you got to be, you know, likable person. <laughs> you got to, you know, work well with others. So Absolutely. that's important. Well, and the tech artist really is, for all intents and purposes, a support role. Yeah. You, you so, have to help people. Like that's, yeah. like in advanced project, we have like a Minji Wu, which is like the main material guy. And, but if, if I see him doing 20 times the same thing that could be done maybe with two hours of my work, but he doesn't have to deal with that, then, then that's where I'm helping. Like we, we kind of helping an, another artist. I, I, on my side, at least, I really am the one putting the last touch in something. I'm gonna help them to get there and support them all the way, but you know, it's usually you, you help, like it's a, it's a teamwork. And, and I think you cannot really know everything 100%. Yeah, that's for sure. A question actually came in through the chat. Uh, you know, how do you avoid programming creep? Uh, it feels like uh, as, tam as time goes on, uh, I'm getting pushed more and more uh, into programming and optimization and further from art. Um, is that just part of the tech art process? And, but I think it's also important as it is to want to take on time. It's practical limitations. Don't be afraid to, you know, say no when it comes. To, someone asks you, "Are you comfortable doing this?" You know, there's a part of you that's always going to want to say yes and learn it, even if you don't know. Uh, but I think you have to be careful doing that. You know, it comes up to me a lot too because you know I've dabbled just enough inside of it that can be dangerous. Um, so <laughs> someone might ask me, "Hey, can you do this?" And I'll, I'll have to respond. You know, just because I might be able to get it compile, I probably shouldn't. The one to do that like that really should be someone <laughs> that should be someone on the rendering team because you know sometimes there's just considerations you might not know the code could have changed out from underneath uh, over the past few months and, and you're making some horrible mistake so I, I would say it's good to to know but try not to get shifted too far outside of your comfort zone because it can be dangerous and probably more effective for your company yeah just be upfront with people about what those limitations are Take anyone no one's going to say oh my god you don't know how to write this c Lambda function, you're fired. Like I've, I've never encountered anything like that in my whole career. Like it's usually okay. Who do we need to help uh, pair you with, or, or, or who do we assign you? 
you can shift this to your value. Okay. Because sometimes we ask for things and we have to realistically say, there's too much going on right now. We don't have the people that find in this area. Maybe that's not the answer that you're looking for. It can't always be everything. There are, there are limitations to what we as humans can mm -hmm. and fit in our brains all at once, you know, learn something you might have to forget else. So that is another part of the balance. Every, every tech artist is going to have to find their own balance of jack of all trades while keeping your skill set first in general, of picking where do you want to specialize, where do you want to part. You know, part of that is realizing you can't be, you know, best of everything because, you know, then you're just sacrificing everything. All trades master. And that's perfectly fine. You know, I think to set out to do if that's your I have to be cognizant. I imagine uh, that, you know, that's part of a broader question in many ways, which is how do you define uh, what what your capabilities are as a tech artist, right? So, uh, you know, uh, you know, even you're, you're, you're both saying it, uh, Bill and, and Simon, when you're saying, you know, I want to dabble more in, you know, Niagara, I want to dabble more in uh, animation systems, I want to dabble more in this and that, uh, so that you don't find yourself in a position where somebody comes up to you and says, I want you to do this thing for this project. And you're like, well, I've never touched that system before. Um, and you find yourself in a position where you've overextended yourself maybe, or, or you've overcommitted to a project and, um, and it becomes really painful to deliver it. Um, I think it's better to underpromise. Like, <laughs> like the team, if you're not fully confident in yourself where you would apply for a job as a gameplay pro, then the team should not be relying on you to implement any gameplay code feature. And if they are, then that's a mistake. Like any C++ skills you bring as a tech and artist should be a bonus and a benefit to you know, your workflow and understanding. They should not be a stopgap replacement for you. Um, so I could see how some producers might get confused about that because they think, oh, this guy's got some programming skills and he can do this. But you know, we really do need to be aware that someone who's built as an engineer, that, that comes along with a lot more training and formal knowledge than a technical artist still does at this time. And that's not to say that technical artists can't be good programmers, but I don't think it's a given. And I don't think it should be a given. That's a great we, we point. We might be able to dabble a little bit, in, but I'm always seeing, for example, like when they're asking me, oh, there is this problem in C++, I'm like, I'm not a programmer. Like somebody that has the knowledge should actually look at that. I might make it, make it work, but I don't know how many things I'm gonna break on the way to make it work. <laughs> you know, I prefer. Well, let me and toss it out to the- That's a definitely a good, you know, there's this question of like how, who's a tech artist? Am I a programmer or a tech artist? Am I an artist or a tech artist? How do I identify students that are kind of coming into my school? So we joked when we met earlier this week about like the old, uh, you might be a tech artist if, <laughs> and that's one of those things, like you might be a tech artist if you can program, but you wouldn't want to submit your code to the project. <laughs> like, <laughs> just, you I can, I'm, I'm right there. Like I will pop open C, sometimes I'll change some stuff, but I would in zero ways feel comfortable submitting my code anybody i would hand uh, copy pasted it over to a programmer and be like hey what about that and they assuredly would tell me how wrong i am but um but yeah so you know i know the c and i can read the c but i i don't feel comfortable i'm with you. but i get somebody to do that and that that's definitely a line for me and and, and like you said Ryan, you have to be comfortable defining that one nope I'm not going to do that. I know I can, maybe ish, uh, but we're better off if if the right person. Does. And it, it can be very vague. Regardless. We're we're not terribly well defined, like a character anime. I know what a character anime mostly. <laughs> it it can also be like a something where you you would. I mean, I talk from my experience at Apex so far is that I would prototype something really quickly in Blueprint. You really don't want to see the spaghetti of it, but it's working. Then when everything is approved, that's, that's the way we're going to go for that direction. The prototype was done really quick. Then 
a real engineer comes in and then look at oh this was done and actually does it like cleaner you know mm -hmm. like production ready but it's much faster maybe for a tech artist to iterate really really quick changing one thing really quickly test it changing one thing really quickly but that doesn't mean that's going to be that part at the end that's going to be used real shipped with the engine or everything it's it's because we we can do that really quickly what where an engineer might not might not do it as quick to iterate mm. but he would mm. do it a much cleaner job than what we might it's usually least, really helpful for them too yeah like it gives them a lot of direction because they don't they don't think a lot of times like a effects artist or tech artist right like it, you give them kind of like a rough blueprints. It's like the sketch and a napkin. Like here's here I want you to sample the data, you know, and here's my crappy blueprint running on tick, doing things a <laughs> hundred times more expensive than it would in native C, you know. Cool. Oh, it actually works. Okay, can you make this run fast? Like this is, this is literally what just happened with me and uh, and some Fortnite stuff we were doing, you know, and it worked. It was a great process, you know. But you've already sussed out all the inputs that you need and you've made it kind of work already. And and so it's yeah. like, you know, okay, well, the team likes it. We know that this works now. Let's just make it actually work. And and, for, and that's a huge relief, I think, for programmers as well, because yep. they're not in that space. And and I can't count the number of times written up a you know a spec for a feature, you hand it to a programmer and you get it back and you're like, that's exactly right, but completely unusable. And then you have to like do this iterative process to figure out like how are we actually going to use this in you know in production and how's that going to scale? Mm -hmm. And and going the other way, kind of reversing that, handing them that blueprint, it, it, it's it's a much a much nicer workflow than and you don't have to type up a design document and try and talk programmer. Uh, and figure out all these uh, requirements. You're just like, here, it looks like this. Yeah, and it's great for testing too when it comes to like, so something closer to gameplay, when you want to prototype something really, really quickly and, and have the, the project owner f making sure, okay, this is the direction we're going. Because they might they might have like changes quite often. And so, it, I think iteration speed is like proving, doing a prototype or a proof of concept. That's kind of like, I think most of my job is like getting, okay, we think we want to do that. Is that even possible? And is that even fun or the right mm. way to do it? So, okay, you have one day to prototype that thing. Even tick, get all actor of class, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we're we're racing up on two hours into the stream, uh, and there was a question that came up that I wanted to to toss into the. Yes, I know Tom's terrified. Um, uh, which uh, our friend Brian asked, which is you know with tech art being such a wide um, field that we've been discussing, you know, should a school that's interested in in teaching tech art specialize in specific types of tech art or should you know it offer sort of a more broad based tech art degree you know um and i think it's a really good question because we've had you know a number of um different academic institutions reach out to us and say we want to focus on tech art uh, but you know what do you guys recommend should they have a generalized tech art degree or should they be more specific and focused on you know different types of tech art I personally am a fan of trying to let the student develop. Um, so you kind of give them a lot of hooks and let them kind of see what they gravitate towards and what they have a natural aptitude for. So I can give personal anecdotal experience. I actually taught university uh, level game development courses in Colorado, like I want to say it was like 2012 or something like that. And it was a it was a course that was actually struggling really, uh, really badly with um, student engagement. So I effectively, I can't remember what the title of it was. It was so lame. It was just some generic university title that you would expect, you know? And I just said, okay, well, I'm gonna change it to this. What effectively I'm gonna call is like a buffet or like a tour of game development. So literally every two weeks or three weeks, it was like, okay, we're doing level layout. Now we're doing scripting. Now we're doing, I think we actually did a, like one week on effects, right? I didn't want to spend too much time on it. Um, 
and I got feedback from all the students that were like, this is, this was the most valuable. I got more out of this one class than I did my entire career because it wasn't about like high level application, you know, and like, and theory and stuff like that. Like game development, it's like, you got to get in there. You've got to do this stuff and experience it. So using that as a, as an analogy now for tech art, I feel like you could do the exact same approach and be successful, right? Or it's like, well, here are here's the wide range of things we do. We do physics simulation. We do material work. We do scripting and blueprints or Python. We do rigging. You know, like let them let them find what they're good at, right? Mm-hmm. Because that's how they're going to be most most successful. A lot of us, I always say like effects and tech art and stuff, it's all kind of merged into one big ball at this point for me. But like this is the career I I I never knew I wanted to do. That's what I tell people, you know, like. It just kind of like you, you have these interests, you have these desires, even though you can't fully identify them or understand them, but you, you push towards them slowly. I've been, I've been creeping towards this where I am now since I was like 15 or something like that, or 10, you know, <laughs> I saw Starship Troopers, you know, <laughs> I was like, I want to do this. You know? you know, I didn't, I didn't know what it was. I knew that at, when I was in high school, I was like, I want to do 3D. You know, I know what's up. <laughs> young naive bill <laughs> so i think give them all those hooks all those opportunities long answer i'm sorry great great answer i i think also is um bef- before joining epic i had my youtube channel where i was doing tutorial and thing and, and what i find out also is that it's it's better to teach why you're doing things than just how to do them like you know if like so the tutorial i was doing was not me telling click on that button and do that and do that but it was more like okay here is the problem here's the approach to how to solve it and and uh so that that was a live stream and i was solving it at the same time as the people watching and a lot of comments were about oh i really like that process where you went completely wrong and that didn't work at all but you learn five things on the way. Mm-hmm. And and what Bill was saying is really, really useful. I think it's like grabbing a lot of different things instead of focusing into high level, you know, software and just click there to do that and that like that. It's just more about the the the, the feeling you get and that kind of thing. And I think uh, if if somebody I didn't I still don't know what tech artists mean. Like I have no idea. <laughs> I well, I just love what I, I'm doing. I recommend you watch and, this uh, the stream after we put it up on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, I would watch that stream to learn more. But I, it's just I really love what I'm doing and uh, trying to. It's, it's just like I never knew. Like Bill was saying, I love when he said that. I never knew this really existed. No, but it kind of you slide into it at at some point, or 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 like like people like Ryan actually built that path. Mm-hmm. slide into that role that nobody knew we needed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm still here. I don't know what happened. Still, the internet. It's years. the internets. But I think that, uh, that that is a, probably a sign for us. Uh, why don't we... Uh, <laughs> I'm back, guys. Why don't Fool we? Uh, We've got another two hours for you. <laughs> We're worried there. I think that uh, you know, considering the time and considering that these guys have some things like you know, fortnights to make and things like that. Um, I uh, are there any sort of uh, final thoughts that you gentlemen would like to leave the stream with as we are wrapping up today's very entertaining and informative becoming a tech artist stream. I know that you've shared some good ones. For me, it's just I'd like to kind of remind people that it, it kind of always feels like when you come and look at what's being done in games and, and tech art that all the cool stuff has been done and all the hard problems have been solved. But I just want to assure people that I felt that way 15 years ago when I started doing this. <laughs> uh, and it's just always how it feels. But somehow it's like we're always finding new things to do and there's always a new thing coming out that's impressive. So just resist the urge to feel like it's hopeless because everything's been done. Cause it's, that's just that old trap to fall into. Um, just find something interesting and start plugging away. And I think you'll be excited by the results. And thank you guys for watching. Thank you for coming. Ryan. Yeah. Super awesome. And and you've got a stream coming up uh, next week, right? It's in two weeks, actually. Two it's going to be on the, the 24th, I think. 
uh, it's a Thursday. Uh, but yeah, we're going to be talking a, a, a little bit of preview of the water tools for 426 uh, and maybe a little bit about the, the volumetric stuff, but still ironing that out. That'll be exciting. Those are always really, really uh, helpful, informative streams. Simon, Bill, closing thoughts? Learn one new thing every day. Keep learning. Like you, you, you have to keep knowing what's coming and what's what's happening and keep learning from the, the, the industry, but also from your peers, like, you know, keep learning stuff. Like we, most of the time, at least I think, I have no idea what I'm doing, but it kind of works. <laughs> Don't you tell know? them. Like, uh, it's, it's, it's keep learning stuff and yeah, and have fun doing it. Transform from that into a game. Like for me, it's working became kind of a game at this point. So it's great. And then and, and thank you for joining. Yeah, uh, don't, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Don't be afraid to admit you don't know something. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Come with an open mind. Somebody Short enough, you can make it a tattoo on your arm if you want it, right? That advice. <laughs> All good Bill advice. Works. Words to live by from Bill. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody live, laugh, love. Something. But it was really oh, cute on the on the chat and said, "Don't get off on a tangent." Boom, boom. Um, you're a tech artist. How about some advice? Man, I'm I'm stunned by "Don't get off on a tangent." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, be normal, Tom. No. Oh. <laughs> for once. <laughs> oh, for once. <laughs> No, I think um, I, you guys hit the nail on the head. It's it's about that scrappiness, that curiosity, finding finding problems. And if if your teachers, if you're a teacher and you want to try and help get students to be tech artists, just when when you find those students that have that that kind of problem solving, uh, you know, they're they're kind of doing. Grit. digging into the tech a little bit whatever it is just just find them and 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 uh you know give them something to do give them a challenge give them a problem to solve and um that's that's what builds i think most tech artists kind of experience it's hard to be like you're a tech artist go tech artists are kind of built over time yeah i think you, you can't really I mean, you can, but like as you're iterating, you don't really break Unreal Engine. I mean, you can break a project, but you know, as you're, I mean, I, I don't know. Do you guys find yourselves breaking Unreal Engine with much frequency? Because you're probably the, the the better candidates to do it. <laughs> Ryan's like looking to the side, like oh, maybe. <laughs> I may have broken it. I may have broken it a couple of times. <laughs> I, can, I broke the build studio. once. <laughs> yeah, I broke the build once in my in my five years. That's pretty good. So I don't do a lot of code submissions though, but I did. Maybe I did I'll, I'll retract that mistake. question from Ryan. <laughs> yeah, no, that uh, volumetric cloud prototype broke the switch build on Fortnite the other day, so I had to go like put in a specific switch to disable that in Fortnite. Yeah. <laughs> the old studio was that if you broke the build, you bought the donuts for everyone. So that that'd be a lot of donuts these days. <laughs> all right well with that note thank you all very much for joining the stream and uh remember that this will be up as a vod on twitch uh you know probably in a couple of hours so you can rewatch it again and enjoy you know all the insights and uh and we'll get it up on youtube on unreal engine uh youtube channel in uh probably next couple days next week and uh you know once again thank you very much ryan thank you very much bill thank you simon thank you tom thank you mark who's been uh, active uh on the chat uh helping and answering questions and putting up links and as usual thank you all and stay safe and have a good weekend and we will see you next week uh and uh yeah come back and join us and thank you again and with that Bye. we are out